Talk about, hmm, I guess, 40 <laughs> years, uh, you know, probably 10 or, 10 or 15 years, <laughs> probably only guitar, I don't know. But uh, I guess seriously for about 40 years. I've been playing seven string guitar for about 30 years. You know, I know I don't look that old, but I am. <laughs> Seven string guitar. I was I was very um, influenced. Uh, I actually started on bass, um, and I got into guitar because when I was a teenager, I started on bass, and I was in rock bands and things like that. And I decided that I wanted to start learning how to compose music. And I thought that it was important at that time for me to learn something about harmony. I didn't know anything. I wasn't trained. I had no musical training at that time at all. It was all basically self-taught. Um, I was lucky enough, I got a guitar, and um, I was pretty good at picking off things off of records, you know, uh, transcribing things off of records, I guess is what we would call it today. Um, the guy in my rock band at that time, who was sort of like cream music, I was playing bass and singing and doing stuff like that. And uh, we used to do these long, I don't know if anybody remembers what this band called Cream, you know, with Eric Clapton and Jan Lewis and the big or whatever. Well, anyway, they, they, they used to have these live records that they would do, and they had these really long, extended pieces. One was called Spoonful. And it was about a 20 minute piece of music. And, you know, we wanted to be just like Cream, so we, we sat there, and it took me months, but I learned everything that Jack Bruce did <laughs> on that 20 minute second. And we tried to duplicate what they were doing. And just to show you how naive I was at that time, I didn't realize until later that they were doing boxing all that. You know, so that was sort of my first you know, introduction to, I guess, jazz and proposition, uh, was the fact that it was kind of a revelation to me that they were just making this up. So that it means that the second time you they played it, they were really doing something completely different. Um, but the, the fact that I had to sit there and learn everything he did, note for note, I mean, that was a real learning session in itself. And it was also something that is very, very important in the way jazz musicians learn music. Um, many jazz musicians, especially the older jazz musicians that didn't have a lot of you know, musical training, but mostly the way they learned was by ear. By picking off things off of records, or you know, gold did when there weren't any records available, they would do it by listening to their colleagues, you know, listening to people and they, they hear something. Ellis Marcellus always had this one thing that I, th I thought was real kind of amusing is to say, you know, on, on Saturday mornings there was a cartoon program. I don't know which one it was, but he used to listen to, and I think I kind of remember what program was, because I remember on, on, a, on, on a Saturday, there was some, some uh, cartoon, and they had this really incredible guitar playing on it, you know, and I found it later, I think it was Howard Roberts, but it's just this really great chords and melodies, just some guy improvising along this, you know, to, to some cartoons, you know, like, you know, cartoon figures running, running through the woods or whatever, or whatever, you heard his really great guitar playing and some really cool chords, um, and there was this one chord that always happened at one particular time in the program, and Ellis said he would listen every Saturday, he would try to find this, he would, he would listen for that, he had this one opportunity to hear that chord. <laughs> there were no tape recorders, there were no MP3 players, there were no Pro Tools at that time, it's like he had this one opportunity every Saturday to try to pick out that one cool chord, you know, so I guess he knows a lot about cartoons. <laughs> but, you know, uh, a lot of what we do is, is learn music by ear. Um, and, you know, I think that's an important thing to realize, you know, that, that you know, what we do uh, at, at the university level, at, and I'm sure you do here too, but at, at, uh, at, at the school, we, we spend a considerable amount of time listening to music and try to transcribe the music by the year. Uh, not only solos, you know, like single note solos and, and things like that, but also um, actually transcribing songs. Uh, one of the things that I do in, in, in my um, class, uh, the theory class, is we, we compile a, sort of a mini fake book of unpublished or unnotated music. You know, some people do music by Brad Meldauer or, you know, or Peter Bernstein or, you know, Papathene or something like that. Things that are not available. And uh, it's a really good process for students to go, go through because, of, you know, I, I find that with jazz musicians a lot of times they do um, spend a considerable amount of time learning people's solos, but I think it's very, very important to learn the entire piece of music. 
And I think that's a really good way to do it, is just to transcribe it. Um, I'm not sure if that's if, is, if that's something that you do if you ever do it in a classical vein. But I mean, is, 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 there, is there any situations that you ever have uh, these students like try to learn part of a classical piece just by it from the record or just from somebody? Yeah, it's happened before. Okay, mm -hmm. you can't find a score and some specific kind yeah. of so it happens. Yeah, so it's, 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 I think it's a really good thing to do. But uh, anyway, getting back to, to the, my history as a guitar player, I I, I uh, I guess when I was about 20 years old, um, we used to have a guitar ensemble, and it was Hank Mackey. And, uh, and my girlfriend at the time was Emily Rambler. I don't know if you ever heard of her. She passed away several years ago, but she was a great jazz guitar player. And we had just sort of a little informal guitar ensemble. We were writing charts for it, things like that. And uh, there was a club at the Hyatt Regency uh, Hotel, um, it was a little jazz club, and Bucky Pizzarelli came to town. And Bucky Pizzarelli was one of the first, you know, I wouldn't say he's the first seven string player, he joins George Van Epps was as far as I'm concerned for jazz. Um, but he he came to town and we asked him to come and he came and sat in with a guitar ensemble. And uh, when I heard that low string, like when he started playing the guitar, and I started hearing these low notes, it just it just really just resonated with me. I guess maybe because I was a bass player originally, you know, but I just really liked the sound of it, you know. It seemed like a really completed the instrument, you know. So I knew at that particular time I wanted Seven string guitar. Um, I couldn't. I couldn't. Uh, you couldn't at that time just go to a music store and find a seven string guitar. There were none to be had. There was only one that was ever made, uh, sort of a special edition that was uh, made by the Gretsch Company for George Van Epps, and it was called the Van Epps um, Seven String Guitar. And um, you couldn't find those at all. But it, uh, sometime after that, I was going to the Berklee College of Music, and, and occasionally. I would come from Boston to New York, and there was a uh, pawn shop um, in New York. And on one of my trips down, there went to the pawn shop, and there on the wall was a George Van Epps seven string guitar for two hundred seventy five dollars. You know, <laughs> something somebody pawned or whatever. But that was my first seven string guitar, uh, and I, I, I played that for many years. Um, uh, played some of my first recordings uh, with that. And um, it just, I, I, I started to out, you know, to outgrow the instrument. And because those kind of instruments weren't available at that time, um, I was confronted with the, the uh, idea, the dilemma that I would have to have a guitar built for me, uh, a seven string guitar. So uh, my first seven string guitar was built by a um, really great guitar builder named uh, Jimmy Foster. And uh, it's kind of a wild looking guitar. But I thought that if I was gonna, if I was gonna have a guitar built for me, you know, and I was going to design the guitar, and I wanted to build it the way I wanted it, you know, and I thought that, wow, it would be really cool because I never really like to own the instrument if I could extend it back lower. So this is one of the things that I've, I've done on the last couple of the guitars. If, if, you, if you have a capo here in the fifth fret, it's like a normal guitar, except that the seventh string doubles the, the fifth string down and on. But, but on this guitar, everything's, everything's down to perfect four. So I guess it goes into what we call the baritone range of the guitar, but it, but it you know it still has a normal range of the guitar too. But I can play lower on the instrument, and you know so that was one of one of the things that I got used to, to doing. And you know so my open strings are all different, but I mean you know like for instance I have an open B, which I really I've kind of gotten used to. I have an open E, but it's an E. It's the same E as on bass. So it's, it's, it's actually an octave lower than, than, a, than a normal guitar. So anyway, this is the kind of guitar I've been playing ever, ever since those, those times, and I've kind of gotten used to it. This is the second evolution, uh, and this guitar was actually built uh, by uh, Salvador Giardina, who's a local guitar luthier in New Orleans. And um, it's basically, um, it's basically totally my design. I just, you know, I made exactly what I, you know, um, actually just put down on paper and actually made like a little styrofoam uh, silhouette of the guitar so I could see what the thickness would be and all that kind of stuff and actually gave it to him. And he just reproduced what I gave him as much as he could. He built everything, even, even these tuning machines. He actually built these with them. They kind of had some. Uh, Battle damage from dropping it a couple times or whatever, but he actually he actually designed everything, or you know actually built everything on the guitar. Um, and I have a, actually have a new guitar that Jimmy Foster built for me. It's a little more of a 
traditional jazz guitar. Um, and I'm trying to get used to playing that one. That's, so I have, I have a collection of seven string guitars. Um, you know, I have a classical seven string guitar, I have a steel string seven string guitar, I have this one, I, I have a, you know, a, Who made I have a seven string guitar. <laughs> that's, that's the other, uh, the, the, you know, yeah, the guitar. Yeah, the guitar. Yeah, the guitar is, kind of, is an instrument that I actually invented uh, uh, in, the, in the early 80s. Uh, I was very much into electronic music, um, and there were no, there was, there was no way for a guitar player to access a synthesizer at that time. In fact, this was before me. I'll show you how long ago this was. But actually, the first guitar was actually a guitar instrument. And it was a, basically, this is something I built, and it was basically just, it looked like sort of a, looks like a log, log, but at every fret key, lo, every, every fret string location, there was a little tiny key, a little lever key, that actually had to build, I took a little piece of copper and actually bent it, and there's like a little switch that I got from radio, a little micro switch from Radio Shack, and so they're like, at every one of these locations, if you press down the fret location like this, you get a note. The thing that was kind of hip about the key tar, is I could play this note on E string, and I could also play that note on E string, and get both of them at the same time. So that was the thing that was above and beyond playing it, and I and I had it hardwired to a Moog polyphonic synthesizer um, with telephone cable because, like I said, there was no, there was no <laughs> media at that time. You know, it's, and the thing still works actually. Good people, all my students say, "When are you gonna bring it out? When are you bring it out?" This this one this one little uh, the guitar actually works. It's just there's a couple of uh, Couple front locations that probably have a re be re soldered, and then the, the synthesizer is the thing. It's it's kind of gone through Katrina, and it was the last time I had it, I was kind of moldy, and <laughs> so that, that probably needs a little work if, if the instrument itself is, is okay. But uh, if you have a Google uh, keytar, there's, really, there's a really funny little uh, thing that somebody, this Canadian group, you know, and it's about me inventing the keytar, it's, and it's 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 kind of funny. Or if you go to Wikipedia. They actually give me credit for like inventing the guitar. But the guitar that we know, that everybody thinks of it is, is actually, you know, they think of the keyboard instrument, but the original design was actually mine. You know? Now I did pad it. I have all I have all the documentation at home, like things I, I did it and sent myself, you know, with the registered mail. I just at that time, you know, I wasn't I wasn't even thinking about that. It was very expensive to get things patented, you know, it was like two thousand dollars. And I just felt like what I had was just basically to something I built in my garage, and I felt like I needed some, you know, somebody to collaborate with, you know. But anyway, that's make a long story short. That's the, you know, I have a seven-string guitar. <laughs> anyway, so I have a collection of seven-string guitars. Uh, anyway, that, any, anybody have any questions yet? Or what, uh, what kind of strings do you use on that? This one, you know, this is kind of curious because I've always. One of the reasons why I got the new guitar built by Jimmy Forrest, and I don't have it here now, was because I, I actually felt like I wanted to make the neck shorter because I wanted to start using these strings called tomastic strings, which I really like. And when I've ever played tomastic strings, they, they, were just, they just sound better than other strings. And I could never use them on this guitar because of this, because <laughs> the, the strings are too short. And they actually come into the neck. And I said, what the heck, I'm just going to put them on anyway. <laughs> so these are actually, these are actually tomastic strings, and you can see, but it doesn't really seem to interfere with the sound anymore. So I just put them on anyway. I just like them. They, they seem to last longer. And they, you know, I don't know, they just, there's a certain evenness, a certain expressiveness that I really like about these strings. You know? Anybody ever heard of strings? They're a little more expensive than. They call it jazz. Is it black one? Black one is Benson. Uh, I don't know. Is there a Benson set of I'm not sure. I th I th well, I think they're called jazz flats or something. I'm not sure what they're called. But, uh, that's what I have on, on the top. You know, What's the size of your high? Uh, it's 13. And, and then, but then this, the seven string is, is, is the one that's always a problem because I wish I a heavy seven string. And this is actually the, this is actually the largest guitar string they make. It's, it's an eight, you know, and I actually use that as a seven one. You know, so that's that that I don't, I've, I've looked all over the place and I have never seen anyone look large, larger than that. And you know in the past normally I would use if it wasn't this guitar, the other guitar I could use a uh, bass string. But um, the problem with bass strings is they have that large, you know, uh, 
string pin, you know, that, you, that I can't, it won't work with this. It's this and so I needed to have a guitar string. This is the largest one I've ever had. The Benson has a 14 foot piece. Has a 14? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I can't bend strings on this thing either. It's just, it's just, it's just too high. And I think having a long neck can make it just hard to bend. You know, but uh, those, those are the little things you have to give up. You know. I find if you have, if you look, if your strings are too light, then it's, I, I like, I like to play finger style a lot of times, and, and, and I like to be able to dig in. And if you have light strings, it's just, it's just really hard to do that. You know. But it's very curious because I, you know, I have, a, I have a student that um, you know is very much in the band of mine heart. He's got one of those McAfee, um, well, it's, it's a copy of a McAfee guitar, and I was, um, I was really, uh, it was kind of a revelation to me that Jack Django used light strings, you know, which is, but he he would pick way back here, the, the, you know, he would really pick very hard, but he actually used light strings as part of the way he got his sound, you know. But um, anyway, I was kind of curious, but uh, I'll try to play something. Uh,
happen to you? Yeah. You're not supposed to say it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it, has, it has happened to me. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, you know, it's something I talk about with my uh, jazz piano students, and I think it would also apply to the jazz guitarists and mm -hmm. the bassists in the room as well. You know, just the difference of getting a lead sheet in front of you and reading through a tune to developing artistry where you're, you know, you've, you've come up with a, a fully realized arrangement. And I know, you know, it takes years, but maybe you could distill that down to two minutes about... Well, yeah, not and not even specifically to show what it is, but just yeah. the, the process of learning, you know, and, and talk about the difference of you know making it your own, like you did there, like a, a full arrangement. What are some of the things a student has to do to get to that point? Well, you know, my my arrangements like this. I mean, to me, that was just I just know the song. I mean, you know, I know I know the melody of the song, I know the harmony of the song, and I just basically make it up you know, as I go, which is kind of like the way, I was very influenced by Joe Pass. Joe Pass is really great at doing that, where he just knows a tune. You know, he has, he has things he works out here, little devices that he uses in, in certain places, but I think, I think the, the beauty of playing this way is the fact that you can, it can be very fluid, you know, it can go a lot of different places, where, you know, some, some people tend to like, you know, uh, work out guitar arrangements, more, more like a, a, a classical musician might play through a classical piece or whatever. Uh, not that it's, it can, it's always going to be the same way, but um, I think the main thing is, is to try to internalize the music as much as possible. Um, I, find that, I find that, especially with guitar players, uh, and myself included, uh, sometimes we don't necessarily learn uh, the, the complete music. Uh, it, when I was growing up in New Orleans, uh, a lot of times I was utilized in, in bands. People would call me because they needed a harmony player. And I was pretty good at playing chords, you know, kind of like, you know, these kind of chords that are more like what I call like four-way close uh, kind of voicings that, you know, more like clustery kind of voicings that, that maybe like guitar players, you know, play these kind of more of the traditional kind of sounding or whatever. So my, my approach to playing the guitar was a little more pianistic. Uh, uh, probably because I was listening to piano players a, a lot. I was listening to Lenny Bro a lot or whatever. But you get back to what his point is, is that I used to get called a lot of times uh, to be a substitute for a piano player. And which means that most of the time there was either a singer or there was someone, a horn player playing the melody. And my weakness always was I didn't know melodies, you know. So I mean, I, I knew thousands of songs, but I didn't really know the complete song because knowing the chord changes is not knowing the song. You know, knowing the melody is, and, and the chord changes and the root motion and things like that is 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 really what it's about in terms of learn, learning the song in the complete sense. So I always found out that was a weakness in my playing. You know? So I had to I had to make sure that the tunes that I thought that I knew I really knew, like I really knew the melody of the song. And, and I knew the, the chord changes of the song, and um, so what I, you know, what I try to do with guitar players, my, my guitar students, and so they don't fall into the same trap, is I make sure that they, they always learn, even on a very very simple level, that they just learn the entire piece at the same, you know, at the right time, you know. So if you're doing, you know. Um, simple, I want to hear the melody and the chords at the same time. I don't want to hear just the chords, I don't want to just hear the melody. Because once you, once you learn everything at one time, especially for a guitar player, and, and I'm sure this is the same thing for a piano player and any other kind of instrument, it's just the process of illumin illumination. If you, if you, if you, if you decide that you, you're just going to play the melody, well you all already know it. A lot of times when I play the melody, I'm playing the melody, but I'm also thinking about, like, if I were if I had to, you know, I, I see where the chords are, I know what the chords are, and I'm, I'm sort of playing a melody thinking about where the chords are at any one particular time. Uh, and same thing with the bass notes. If I, if I, you know, if I just want to play chords, you know, I'm just playing, I'm playing the same thing I would normally do with the melody, but I'm, but I'm eliminating the melody. So I'm just sort of always trying to learn the tune and internalize the tune in its entirety uh, so that you don't learn components. Because I find it was really difficult for me 
having to know a lot of chorus to tunes, it was really hard for me to, to try to start putting melody into the chorus, because sometimes the melody just didn't work where I was voicing the chorus. The other thing good, too, is, is, is a, a guitar playing piano player, is if you always, if you really know the melody of the tune and you know the harmony of the tune, if you're accompanying someone, you're less likely to, 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 to uh, step on them. You know, like sometimes, I mean, if you're playing a tune like uh, All the Things You Are, <laughs> You know, guitar player. So, well, it's an F minor seven chord. I can play this chord. You know, play that chord. And the singer's trying to play. And then, you know, it's like you, you, you get these clashes because it's because you're looking at the chord symbol and you're not really thinking in terms of what the melody of the chord is or what the horn player or the singer has to has to uh, to play. You know, so it's just very very important that you learn the entire tune in its entirety and and and, um, and that you internalize the music. You know, I can't stress enough that it's it's very very important that uh, you, you learn you, you learn to memorize music and learn to hear music and say, just take the stuff like uh, you know I mean if you went if you if you took a tune like uh, 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 well let me think of something very 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 simple um, well I don't know if you took a tune like like Happy Birthday. How does people learn how to internalize tunes then? Well, I think I think you know a lot of it has to do with just the experimentation. I think mem memorizing the tunes, but but just just uh, uh, you know what I call creative doodling, which is basically just uh, you know playing playing. No, no, I'm just, just so students have an idea of, you know, again, you know, going from the difference of, you know, like just looking at a lead sheet and, you know, playing the chords and the melody to, yeah. to, to a fully realized arrangement like you yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I think the main thing is that if you play the tune enough that you don't need the, the lead sheet anymore. Yeah. But, you know, in a, in a lead sheet is just a very, very, uh, it's just a very basic road map, you know. I mean, you know, you, you don't want to play the melody exactly like a lead sheet, unless, unless it's an arrangement that someone's, you know, is, is you know, is, is sort of thought that's thrown through, and, you, and you're playing as an ensemble or something. You have to you play it. But most most lead sheets, like when you find in a fake book or something like that, the melodies are very very generic. You know, sometimes they're like right on down beats and things like that. In fact, that's one that's one of the things that most, if you're an arranging student, that's one of the first things that, are, that an arranging teacher will tell you how to do. Is like, well, take this melody and rhythmize it. You know, uh, make it an interesting melody, like the way maybe a, a, a somebody would interpret the melody uh, and, and, and try to make it more interesting that way. Because a lead sheet is a sort of a basic roadmap. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you have to play that particular chord. It doesn't mean you have to play the melody exactly that way. Uh, and, that, and I'm saying that in sort of a general, in general sense. So it really, it, you know, from that standpoint, you, you have to just investigate the, the tune as much as you possibly can, you know, like uh, improvise on the tune. You know, to see if you can improvise off the melody. You know, like if I took that tune and uh, just sort of improvise off the melody. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
I'm just, just, just trying to improvise off the melody. It's a very, very good thing. In fact, that's what, that's what the traditional guys always did. You know, before bebop, I mean, that's, that's what they would do. You would, you would play a tune, and you would basically embellish the melody. And play, 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 your solo was just sort of an embellishment of the melody. It was when, when the beboppers came along that they started getting more into the, 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 the inside, the, the actual chord changes of the tune, playing more of the harmony of the tune. But that's kind of a lost part, is, is, is to play off the melody uh, of a song. You know? But you know, my, my contention is, is that, that it's always about that. You know, even, even Charlie Parker, you know, people think, think in terms of like when we analyze his souls and stuff like that, and they are very, it, you know, it's, it, it's very structurally, it's, it's very, very much reflected of the, the harmony that's there. To me, I think he was just thinking melodies. It's just that his melodies were more specific to specific chords, but there were always melodies. And I think that's the thing that you have to always realize is that what you're doing is you're making melodies, you know, when, when you think about You're not playing from the chords. <laughs> you're not playing, you're trying. The, the goal is not to make the changes. The goal is to make music, you know. And I find a lot of times that, that students will uh, sort of uh, improvise uh, uh, in, a, in a way that sounds like they're playing from chord to chord to chord to chord. You know, that's usually, if, if you haven't improvised very much, that's usually the way you have to think about it. You know, I can play the arpeggios on that chord, I can play the scale on that chord, or whatever, but it sounds like they're improvising from chord to chord to chord, instead of like hearing what the tune is about, trying to hear melodies on top of it, you know. So to me, like internalizing the music and, and, the, and having the ability to, to hear on top of it is a very, very important thing, you know. Um, to me, whenever you whenever you play on a, on any kind of composition, you know you always have. There's always two different ways you can, you can approach playing on this. You can think in terms of, of uh, playing specifically on chords, like the way a bebop would do, or you can play more generally on the modality uh, of of a tune. Uh, for instance, if I play, you know. Aspect 
but you start you start to lose the ability like to actually hear and sort of uh, envision what melodies uh, would work with the Anyway, another question. Right hand. Yeah. Um, you're using your right hand to do the chord note melody. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see any particular mm -hmm. faithfulness to playing bottom strings with one finger. And I didn't notice if you were using, I couldn't tell if you were using the pads or the fingernails. Mm -hmm. And if you use the fingernails, how do you keep them healthy without breaking them? Well, that's, that's, good. that's good. That's a good uh, guitar question. I, I, you know, that's um, luckily I, my my fingernails have sort of been pretty strong. I do, um, I do. There are, they are, you know, I do. I definitely use nail when I when I play. It's a sort of a combination. I guess. You know, and my goal is to try. Switch pick, and it's basically because I played a long time ago with this guy named Lenny Bro, uh, really great uh, uh, jazz guitar player, sort of an underground figure. But but um, he was he, he he was a traditional like Nashville thumb pick, and uh, when he played, so he, he he used it. Yeah, I just could never use a, a, a thumb pick because it was always like this really, you know, uh, too uh, difficult to manipulate. You know, so I, I made this thing where I, I sort of pushed the uh, the uh, the, the brace off to the side, so when I'm using it like this, it doesn't come in contact. So I can do, you know, I, I can, I can, I can do fast picking or just what I would normally do with a flat picking, and then, and then when I when I use it as a thumb pick, I just have to slide it on my finger like that. And then, you know, I can use, you know, finger style. Like, but in, in terms of the health of my nails, one of the things I always use is, uh, and Jeff probably knows about this, you know, is, is this thing called a shine stick. <laughs> Which is uh, you, it's, you can buy it in Wal <laughs> Walgreens, and basically it's uh, I have one somewhere in here. But basically it's just it's just a fingernail, you know, kind of sophisticated fingernail file, and it's got eight different grades of sanding on it, you know. And what I'll do is uh, shape the nail, and then I make sure that I go through all the eight different steps of trying to make it really, really smooth, and that really helps me, you know. By the by the time you get to the eighth degree, which is almost like you know leather, you know, it's not just no abrasiveness to it at all. The side of your nail is like glass, you know. So it really helps. It helps preserve the nail, especially when you're playing steel string guitar. You know, if you're playing nylon string, it's, it's not as much of a problem. But steel string guitar, like at the end of the night, I'll have grooves in my the side of my nail. And in fact, I have, usually have to put like a fingernail file on stage because sometimes I'll break the nail or something like that and it just ruins me because you know, I can't. Uh, I won't be able to, you know, play it effectively. So I try. I'm very conscious of that. Um, I've actually gone through stages. There's a couple of friends of mine that, that actually uh, treat their nails with uh, stuff. Uh, there's a guy named Billy Solly and also John Rankin. And they actually have their nails professionally done. And the, the nail is actually about, mm, I guess it's about an eighth of an inch thick. I mean, it's really, really very thick. They, they, they go and they, they put this uh, nail stuff, it's almost like epoxy or whatever. Um, and uh, it's, it's a great sound. I mean, it sounds like you have five picks now, you know. Um, it's, it's really cool. The only problem, I've tried a couple of times and it always comes off. And it's just, I don't know. I, I find if I, if, I keep it, if I keep my nails healthy and stay in the sun a lot. What about exercises that you warm up with if you rise in Right. Well, I think, I think one of the, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're a guitar player and you've never played finger styles before, one of, the, one of the, the best things to try to do is just to do arpeggios. Mm -hmm. You know, like... You know, there's, there's a real beauty in, in playing pick style guitar. It's kind of a lost art too. But when you when you you know just just that strumming sound, you know, what I mean, that's a really beautiful sound because the top note is the last note you hear. But just trying to duplicate that with your fingers, you know. And so I'll, I'll do a lot of things like that. Right? Just sort of roll. Because also 
telling you that's what I wanted to sound like. I wanted to, I have a, I wanted to sound like almost like a kid where I'm sort of waiting for it. It made it sound very even. So that's one of the things I'm gonna, I, I tend to do, which is to uh, tell people to do, you know. But, uh, and I, you know, I'm by no means classically trained. That's one of the things that you have to, you know, if you're gonna play, if you're gonna play figure, finger style on a steel string guitar, I think you have to have some nail, you know. Um, I've heard people do it without it, but uh, I'm not sure if Joe Pass had nail or not, but he, he always seemed to get a very nice sound on uh, that really good melody. It's, it's always sort of a very dark sound, and, it, and it's a very uneven sound. You know, the students I've had that have tried to play uh, where they're starting to get into, you know, not play just with a pick, but one, one play finger style too. That their sound is always very, very uneven, and I think that's the hardest thing to do is to try to make things come out in an even kind of way. Say anything, Yeah. Something else. Yeah. Maybe some guys could play with you, possibly. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Yeah. Who wants to play? Mm -hmm. Dudley, play something. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna. Do you want to enjoy it, Dudley? Are you going to take a break between hours or no break? Use, use, use the director. It's uh, <laughs> time to do it. It's time to do it. It's time to do it right now. Or, yeah. Just those are the Whatever. Whatever. It doesn't matter, maybe. <laughs> Uh, if, oh. if, if, Steve, you don't mind going straight through? I don't, I don't you know, there, there might be some guy, like quite a few guys that are going to have to leave yeah. now. Yeah. So maybe, 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 maybe anyone that has to leave, maybe they could leave now so to avoid the, sure. the, the disruption. Right. And, then, uh, and then we'll just move right on. Sure. <laughs> I guess you mean the sticker. Yeah, I'm 
on water. Yeah. 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 That's true. He disappeared. I saw a lot of emails. I saw a lot of emails.
Brazil and the rhythms of, of Brazil. And he kind of, we had a, a world beat combo at one time. And, and uh, he was really helpful in terms of like this, uh, giving us up to speed on Brazilian culture, you know, and, and the way Brazilians would play things, you know, rhythmically. Drums? <laughs> Is there anybody that this drummer can play? Time? <laughs> they shot he wanted to play the timpani. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's good. It's 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 really advanced to play without drums. But I mean, I think that you know, if there's if there's a certain, uh, you know, if, if if I had to think in terms of like the importance of uh, melody and rhythm in jazz, to me, it's like rhythm in pulse is like the most important thing, you know, because it's, because it's, this music was always based upon dance music, basically. It's, 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 it's like, it's like anything else, like, it's like Latin music or hip hop or anything else, and it really, it requires, a, you know, that everybody agree where the pulse of the tune is. And the whole basis of swing is, is you know, sort of playing with a heightened sense of where the, where the time is, you know. So, uh, it's a challenge, but we'll try it. Let's, let's, let's see. You know, in, in a situation like this, unfortunately, the bass player is the guy. You know, but uh, so what do we want in all things? Can you do the intro? Or is that right now? Yeah, you got it. All right. Uh, I have to internalize it. Up. I have to internalize it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, and, uh, let, let, let's talk, just just for a second. Let's talk about that for a second, because I mean, in terms in terms of um, jazz, I mean, in terms of, in terms of learning repertoire, that's always kind of you know, <coughs> is to try to you know, it, 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 as a jazz musician, you're, you're sort of expected to know uh, you know a, a considerable amount of tunes by heart. You know, all the things you are is, is, is obviously one of them. You know, and uh, that's always you know, we don't have like a like a a set, you know, list of like you have to learn these particular tunes. I find it, I find it a good way to um, I find it a good way to, to approach that if you're trying to build up your repertoire as a jazz musician is and rather than looking at Facebook and doing all the tunes in, in this you know in the real book or whatever, is to think in terms of composers. You know, like Charlie Parker. You know, it's like try to learn four or five Charlie Parker heads, you know, try to learn four or five Polonius Monk tunes. You know, try to learn four or five John Coltrane. To think of the, 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 the you know the prominent composers in jazz, and then think about like trying to grab a tune from each one of those and build your repertoire that way. So you're not like looking at a particular fake book and just like you know going through the alphabet or whatever. You know, it's, it's kind of a good shotgun approach to to, 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 to learn tunes. But you know, you're you're expected to have you know a certain basic repertoire, but. Uh, Sorry, guys. Anything for you, Ben? The bass. Anything for you? Listen there. I would put it there, yeah. All right, so let's. Good tempo. This is two and four.
it's almost like a religious thing that you have to like devote yourself to the core. <laughs> it's like it's like it has to be, and you have to do, you have to do it. And I, I go through this a lot with the compound teacher right now. That, that, you know, this is, you know, we have a guitar ensemble, but something. It's a really good rhythm section, but they uh, sometimes they're just not connecting. Sometimes it's rushing. I'm doing fast tempos. They rush. We do slow tempos. And they kind of drag and whatever. But and a lot of times it has to do with getting into doing things that are just too complicated. Sometimes the drummer's trying to like interact with a solo with us and he's doing all these crazy things and stuff like that. And the, the, sometimes the guitar player's rushing and he's going with him and it's kind of like, you know, he's falling off of a bridge, you know. He's, he's trying to go to these rhythmic things and, and the solo with the solos might not be strong enough uh, to, to be right locked into the time or whatever. The drummer goes with it and everything like is chaotic. You know, so one of the things that I always try to tell him to do uh, is just see if you can swing just playing quarter. Don't put any da 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 bump in it. But, you know, don't, don't do any kind of like uh, ornamentation at all. Just see if you can make your quarter of a swing. And I'm talking like a drummer, ting, 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 ting. And you notice that if, 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 you put, if you force them to play quarter notes and it's a swing tune, eventually, and hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll hear this, but they're going to start, ever, ever so slightly, they're going to start making ting, 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 ting. They're going to start making it, the, the two and four a little more loud <laughs> than the rest of the notes because in jazz a lot of times we, we feel, you know, we, we like to feel the, 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 the two and four, the backbeats of the tune, you know. So you know you're playing quarter notes. So that's, you know, you, you'll find that the really great players, man, especially bass players and drummers or whatever, that they're completely focused in the groove of the tune. And that's where you, you, you agree on where the time is. And it's not, it doesn't come from the ornamentation, it doesn't come from, you know, uh, uh, you know, interacting with soloists and stuff like that. I mean, all that good stuff can happen. I mean, a really great advanced player is like when you hear Herbie Hancock's ensemble play, and it's like you can't even tell where one is. It's just that they, they, they've all, they all have such a strong sense of where the pulse of the tune is. You know, they're agreeing on where the pulse of the tune is. That, um, uh, that they can all stretch the time, but still know where the time is. You know, and, but in a very basic sense, it's like, it's like, you know, Try to learn how to swing with just quarter notes first. You know. Now, as you get as you get the faster tempos, it's like uh, I remember we had a long time ago. We had uh, at, at UNO we had uh, Alan Dawson came and did a clinic, and I thought it was really great because he thought he 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 showed the class how he, he started like with a ballad and went up to like a really fast tempo tune, and he showed how no matter how fast the tune was, he was always hearing the tune. He was, he was trying to relate it to heartbeats. In other words, like if you have a normal heartbeat, it's sort of like this or whatever, you know. So if, you, if it's an up tempo tune, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, if it's, if it's, if it's a ballad, one, dum, 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 you know, you, you might have to sub the beat, subdivide the beat in a ballad, but you're still hearing the pulse like this. You try, it doesn't matter how fast or how slow the tune is, you're always trying to hear the tune where, where, where it's. Somewhere around that that vicinity, and I find it like especially like with up tempo tunes, and it's it's kind of hard to do up tempo tune without a, without a drummer being present or whatever. But if you have a situation where people are rushing in an up tempo situation, it's it's really cool to think in terms of like you know uh, widening your, your 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 perceptions of where the pulse should be. So if it's a really fast. One, you know, if I'm if, I, if I'm if I'm thinking one two three four one two three four, it, 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 you just can't do that. You know, it's just, it, it's, it, it's it's bound to slow up and it's bound to, 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 to speed up or slow down or whatever. But if you think it this way, you know, if, if, if it's like an up tempo tune, you go one two three four one two three four. Yeah, that's 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 it's just much easier to feel. We all agree this is the pulse now. It's just like you can play you can play an up tempo tune like it's a like it's a slow funk tune. I can't do that if I'm it's just too easy for me to, to lose where the groove of the tune is, you know. And I, well I, I, I would if it was a drum here, but I know if we, we can do let's let's say like you know I did, Let's say we do. Do we know Cherokee by any chance? Yeah.
Jones. And I was trying to like understand what he was doing from Paul, from quarter note to quarter note, but he wasn't thinking that way. So everything he did in between didn't didn't subdivide the way I was thinking about it, you know. But after I, you know, understood how he was thinking, it was easier for me to uh, to to uh, play along with them. You know? uh, but the idea of playing, you know, um, a developing sense of time. I mean, one of the things, one of the things that's just very, very fundamental is, like, if, you know, if you play on two and four, let's let's all snap on two and four, like this. All right, and here's the first note. We're going to sing this tune. One, Mean, 
that everybody should do that. I mean, you know, a guitar is a very percussive instrument, you know, it's almost like playing the drums with, with the pitches, you know. Piano, too, it's a very percussive instrument. Uh, horn players usually get away with murder. I, it, one, of, one of the things I try to have you do sometimes is we'll, we'll, we'll uh, you know, we'll play a tune like, uh, you know, like uh, what we were just playing or whatever, and the rhythm section will play for like eight bars, and we'll have each instrument play by themselves for eight bars. And then it becomes very apparent like where your sense of time is because you have to keep that eight bar phrase going with no rhythm section behind you, you know, because we're so used to like leaning on these guys to give us the time. So that's that's a good that's a good practice, but everybody has to develop their sense of time just as, as acutely as a, as a drummer would have to do, uh, you know, uh, develop their sense of time. You know, so it's not just a rhythm section thing. That being said, yeah. Well, that being said, well, that being said, it's like it's like you know, if you ever listen to a Latin rhythm section, you know, Latin rhythm section, everybody's keeping, you know, you, you have these different drums that are all keeping time, and then you usually have one person in the band that's soloing. And a soloist should, should be able to do whatever he wants to do. I mean, he should be play as out or crazy as he possibly wants to do, and that rhythm section has to keep the pulse perfect. So, in a, in a, in, a, in the same sense, in a jazz situation like this kind of situation where the, where the, where the you know, the bass player's keeping time, and you, we're trying to keep the tune together, or whatever. You should be able to do whatever you want. Now, I'm not saying that you know you shouldn't have a good, really strong sense of time, but you should have the ability to do whatever you want uh, and, and still not affect what they're doing. You know, sometimes, sometimes that's what happens is if, you, if you're playing a certain way and it's not in the groove, then the, the rhythm section starts to kind of hear what you're doing and they, and they get off or whatever. You really just think about is just hearing hearing the pulse maybe. Yeah, well, everybody has to agree on what the pulse is. I mean, you know, it's, it's a, you know, it's like you have to, you know, you have to develop a really strong clock, internal clock. You know, that's really what it comes down to. You know, uh, snapping on two and four. You know, I guess if you if you, if you, if you grew up in Sunday church going to gospel choir, everybody's snapping on two and four. Then you got it's going to be sort of like you know, it's going to be natural to you. You know, uh, the student I have from Brazil. In Brazil, they all clap, clap it, you know. Like when they clap, you know, like we clap, you know, you know, one and three or two and four. And in the United States, they clap, clap it, you know, like the mean. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking seven, four, seven, four, clap it. It's, it's very natural for them just to clap in clap it because that's because that's that's well, you know it's part of their culture, you know, and that's what they've been hearing all their life. You know? But um, to me, it's like that's that's a very very important part of jazz musicians development. Just developing a very strong, heightened sense sense of time, and having a very strong internal clock. You know, and the only way I really know how to develop that, if 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 you don't have it already, and, and it's certainly you can certainly develop it because I never had it when I was young. I don't think you know. I, I, I don't think I was just like innately born with a, with a good sense of rhythm. Is to, is to work with the metronome or play drums. You know, I mean, I'll I'll make cats play drums. You know, I mean, just think about what a drummer has to do. You know, I mean, you know, uh, I remember what Herlin Riley came to UNO one time, and he was showing, you know, okay, he's got to keep, he's got to keep the, the high hat on two and four, and he's keeping time with his hand, and he's doing something with, 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 with the snare drum, and on top of all, all the stuff he's doing, he's singing the song, and singing melodies on top of the song. <laughs> so it's like, you know, man, if a drummer can, has to do all that with all every limb of his body, you know, the least we can do is be able to like snap on two and four and sing a song, you know, or you know, like improvise it. A tune or whatever. So, and that's those, those kind of things will make you very, very aware of you know your time deficiencies. And you know, if, if you look at all the, I can't say as, as, as a general statement, but many, many of the great jazz players that we all know can also play incredible drums. Chick Corea, unbelievable drummer. Joe Lamont can play drums really, really well. Uh, Jaco got stories. I remember seeing I remember seeing Web Report a long time ago when it came to New Orleans, and they opened the show with Jaco playing drums, <laughs> and he just saw, he sounded as good as Peter Erskine. When he, you know, he was, it was incredible. You know, so I think that I think that that's a, a you know if you know if you have time, you know I know a lot of times in in, in um, uh, you know music programs a lot of times that you know we, we get get into like jazz theory or, or you know analyzing things from a melodic and a harmonic standpoint, you know, but from a, when you're dealing with music that's rhythmically based like jazz, it's just as important to you know learn your chords and learn your modes and things like that. It's just as important to learn about rhythm 
you know, learn how to function in the rhythm section, learn how to develop your time, because it's because you you are dealing with music that happens in time, and it usually happens with a, sp a specific pulse. And again, I'm just I'm not just talking about jazz. I'm talking about any any music. Uh, there's a there's a uh, school I did a, a little residency in Copenhagen called it's called the, uh, the Conservatory of Rhythmic Music, and they, they, they call it that. They don't call it a jazz school because they deal with all kinds of stuff. They deal with you know hip hop, you know rap, you know Latin music, uh, uh, Indian music, uh, all any kind of music that's based upon rhythm, specifically upon, upon rhythm. And um, it was kind of an interesting concept because it, it, it was kind of a, it's a prestigious school that's <coughs> open to like anybody in the, the European community, you know. But they only accept like 60 students from all around Europe or whatever. One of the things that they that they did for the audition is they made students dance. Now, have you ever had an audition where you had to dance? <laughs> well, they, they wanted to see how musicians reacted to the pulse of the tune. You know, and you know, it's it's kind of like a really valid thing when you think about it. I mean, it's just like if you feel the rhythm, you know, you can feel it through your body. You know, um, you know, um, Danilo Perez. He, he was. He did a clinic one time and he was talking about, you know, how you should, you know, um, think in terms of like walking, you know, like. Just like as you walk in practice while you're walking. Yeah, practice while you're walking. You know, just like like like, or just having having something on your body that's moving while you're while you're doing something against that. You know, so it's it's just those are things to me that are good, are good uh, ways of developing your your time. You know, because I, I I find that a lot. You know, we, we kind of concentrate on a lot of the, the the melodic and the harmonic aspects of improvisation. You know, but we don't seem to get too much into the the, the intricacies of rhythm. You know, but that's to me is like probably you know the most important thing. Yeah. Another question. I remember uh, uh, drummer Chad Wackerman saying one time that, that you know rhythm is all around us constantly, and right. you just have to tune into it. It is at the simplest level is language. Yeah. You know, so you listen to the radio, you listen to the you know the on-air personality saying something. You know, mimic back the, the speech pattern. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah Making yeah. some kind of a comment. You yeah. like to, to, to well, it's all and, and all the pop music, everything, everything you listen to is just really strong from a rhythmic, rhythmic sense. You know, but um, I guess we just kind of take it for granted. It's not, it's not something that's, you know, unless you're a drummer or whatever. It's not something we, we, we pretend to like think about or talk about or try to develop too much. But it's, 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 it's definitely a very uh, important thing. Um, other than that, you know, the other thing, the other thing that I wanted to kind of just talk about a little bit, like when you play on my team, like, let's, let me go back to all things you are. You know, that's a good part. Yeah, all things you are. Uh, is the idea of playing thematically, you know, and this is one of the things that, that is, is really hard to get, get into doing and forcing myself to do it as much as I can. Because what happens a lot of times when you're trying to learn how to play on teams, is you look at these chords, it's like if it's F minor, B flat minor seven, B flat seven, B flat major seven. And you start to think in terms of like, well, you know, this is all A flat, so I can kind of make up whatever I want in A flat or whatever. But the idea is to think about a theme, you know. If I if if I open up my line like if I do that, like that's that's my first line that I play in that line, what am I gonna do to answer that? I was actually thinking like eight bar phrases, 
I was, I was trying to think of like whatever I played when the beginning of my eight bar phrase, I was going to try and make the rest of the eight bar phrase be related to, to what I just did. And you know, that's and I was trying to be as obvious as I possibly can, but you know, uh, um, that's something that, that I find is, is very, very important, you know, is, is an advanced concept of improvisation, is that you improvise thematically. You know, you don't improvise off the chords, you don't improvise off the you know, the, what you think the scales are. You know, I mean, those things are all valid, but at, at this point, you know, it's like you, you, know, you, sh you should know all that stuff. Uh, you, you know, you should have internalized those, those, those things, like how to hear modes and, 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 and things like that. But in, 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 at the very basic level, what you're doing is you're, you're doing theme and variations. You know, you're playing a theme and then you're varying the theme, you know, and, it, and it's sort of like one phrase suggests another phrase. This is why it's, it, this is why it's always good to do. Um, to do uh, a call and response type of stuff, you know. Because if I did, can we play, can we play all the joint? <coughs> all right, I'm going to play a two measure phrase. Let's do it you and me. I'm going to play a two measure phrase. I'm going to play, a, and then I want you to answer my phrase. Now, I, you don't have to answer it exactly what I'm playing, but I would like you to answer it, try to answer the shape, and try to answer the exact rhythm of what I do. Okay? Here we go. One. And we're starting at the top of the thing. Yeah. One, two, one, two, three. <laughs> Again, that you kind of pick up on what you did there. You know, you can improvise with form, 
in the same way that tunes have a form. In fact, that's that's the sort of the advanced way of thinking on point tunes is that they think in terms of the you know improvise on the form of the tune and instruction your 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 solo in that way. Any questions? Uh, that sounds like uh, something Stevie Ray Vaughan would say. Oh yeah. <laughs> He was never at a loss <coughs> what to do next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if, if you're singing on your instrument, you know, and I, I think that, you know, ultimately, I, I always use I always use singers as an, as an example. I mean, if you really, uh, you know, sometimes sometimes the fact that we play instruments that have buttons and have frets and have have like you know uh, keys and things like that or whatever, sometimes that that becomes like a. a, a a way of diverting you from your inner voice, you know, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to sing our instrument, you know, we're trying, we're trying to connect with what we're hearing inside. And sometimes the fact that we have, because these are these massive, uh, difficult instruments that we play, and we spend so much time, so much time with just sort of rudiments of like playing scales and things like that, is we, we, we sort of lose track of like what our voice is trying to say inside, like what we're hearing, you know, we get sort of detached from our inner voice. But a singer, you know, and you know, we spend a lot of time on, on just trying to like, you know, practice scales and things like that or whatever. Singers have nothing to go on. They have no, you know, they have no buttons, they have no frets. You know, I guess, you know, if you're an advanced singer, I mean, I'm sure they can recognize that they're getting a C here or there or whatever. But, you know, do you think Ella Fitzgerald was, was thinking about like, hey, I'm playing a, a mixed lady mode here when I'm so on this or blah, blah, blah. No, and she's just, she's just hearing, she's, she's absorbed the tune organically. Uh, is internalized the tune and is reacting to which what, she, what she's hearing within the tune. So, uh, just for other suggestions for uh, becoming more uh, thematic, you suggested uh, you know the, the call and response exercise mm -hmm. and, uh, using the form, the melody. Are there any other um, uh, you know good practice techniques you can think of? To, I think uh, I think one of the best I think one of the best things to do. Yeah. I, I discovered this a long time ago when I was like actually at Berkeley. When I and you know, we used to get together with guys in the dorm and just play two guitars, just play. You know, we'd all try to play our favorite licks and you know, play. I always felt like at that particular time, uh, did you have a goal in mind, or were you just well? No, I was very green to the whole process, even of improvisation. You know, I mean, I was trying to understand what the scales were and our pitches were and all that kind of stuff. But I, you know, ultimately, you know, I had a couple of Larry Coryell licks that I learned because I was transcribing off of a, a record or whatever. I had my favorite licks that I just could play on an instrument. I, I, I kind of make four those on every tune I played on. You know. I think I got through all the way through Berkeley on one Larry Coryell lick. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, but no, no, I'm just, I'm not saying that. I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying that one of the things that was a revelation to me at that particular time is I, I got very frustrated because I just felt like I, I just sounded very repetitive. I just everything I was doing just sounded like I was doing, you know, every time I got to an F minor chord, I plugged this link in, or every time I got to this chord, I plugged this link in, or whatever. And I just said, is this really what improvisation is about? You know, I mean, you know, I didn't, I didn't really have anybody telling me otherwise. I didn't have any like some spiritual leader or whatever. But just by happenstance, and probably because I was, I, I had been listening to Oscar Peterson and maybe Keith Jarrett and those kind of people who kind of like sing along with the playing. Mm -hmm. I just one day I just started singing along my plane. You know, just like my like Intention behind what you play, 
The other thing about singing along to playing, and you hear a lot of guys do it now, like, like uh, Kurt Rosenblum does it, you know, and uh, a, lot, a lot of those kind of guys that sing along to playing as, as an effect. But, but uh, uh, I think one of the things that it really does, it, it really clarifies what you're trying to say on the instrument, especially if you're playing guitar. Um, it, you tend to play on an instrument like this where you can, you can feasibly play continuous 16th notes or 8th notes without ever taking a breath. You know, you have to breathe when you sing, you know? Because that's usually, that's usually the first thing with people that don't play a horn or you know, whatever, is they don't, they don't leave any space for breathing. You know, like piano players and bass players and guitar players and whatever, we're just notorious for playing continuous notes, you know? And it's, again, you know, everything we do in music is all, it's all, you know, just sort of evolved from the first instrument, which is basically the human voice, you know, and that's the most organic thing, you know. So it's like if you can, if you can sort of be in touch with by doing that, like just singing along, you play. Just try doing that sometimes. Just try to see if when you improvise, to see if you can, if you can just sing along, you play. Especially the guitar. Another, another thing that, we, that we, we're kind of notorious about doing is we cut things off, you know. We make everything really kind of short, you know, like we never really land on anything. And if you sing on, you know, it just never occurs to guitar players to sort of like land somewhere, you know what I mean? It's like when you play a line, it's kind of like shooting an arrow, you know, and it's got to land somewhere, you know, you can't just keep flying, you know, you have to have, you have to have, Places where it will, will land, you know. Um, anyway, yeah. So uh, th those are some things that, that, that would be that to me help help clarify things. You know. Uh, another good thing to do, like we go back to. Uh, uh, <laughs>
that or not? And it's like, uh, you know, it's like, it, you know, it's like, it's always like something that I have to like, either it happens or it doesn't happen. You know, fall on my face or, you know, or I just like try to just concentrate. And usually if you just sort of like, if you can, if you can think of the tune you're playing and you just kind of glean something from uh, a, a couple of notes, I call them cell forms, you know, like, like two notes, three notes or whatever. And use that as sort of like just like a, 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 a vehicle to just to make up something on the spot, you know, that you can use. As opposed to, you know, as opposed to going one, six, two, five, like a classical, you know, uh, you know, uh, way to set up a tune or whatever that you would do on a, a you know, a GB gig or something like that or whatever. But that's a really good thing. I've been trying to do that with my, my guitar students, the more advanced students, is I'll, uh, they'll come in and I'll just play a theme for them <laughs> and I say, improvise something on this thing. <coughs> you know, and I'll just see what they can come up with, you know. And it's hard on guitar. I mean, you know, this piano, you've got, you got two hands, you can be more independent, but, but you know, it's, 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 it's hard to do, you know. Uh, but it, it's, it's a really good training because you really have nothing else to go on except those three notes, you know. And you try to make music, and you try, and it, it works really good if you're doing something like this where you, where you set up a, a ballad or something like that. How are we doing? Man? We're going to have to wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Any other uh, last minute questions? I'll give Steve a plug, which is, uh, for those of you that might not be aware of this, he has a book out through <coughs> El Bay through the Sessions series, right. and it's uh, all on ear training and reacting to sound. And right. uh, it's, it's nice. Yeah, uh, Steve yeah. gave me a copy of it. Yeah, he's had a lot of this, uh, trying, trying, to, trying to hear modality, you know, where it's like, uh, where, you know, chords, Groups of chords tend to have, you know, uh, uh, present sort of a create sort of a gravitational field of hearing, you know, which is like a tonal center or whatever. And trying trying to hear tonal centers uh, in, on common types of uh, diatonic systems, and uh, it's it's a good thing. You can do it a lot. Just, just practice things, you know. Like if you did, like I'll do this. Like I'll take a I'll take a, a note that's like a pedal point, you know. You do, when you do these kind of exercises, you, you 
find some curious things. You know, like a lot of times if, if, if I have people singing from high up, a lot of times they'll hit they'll hit like this note if I play like a Lydian chord.